to say a very big thank you to everyone uh, who has uh, sent me a message, text messages, Facebook messages, uh, birthday cards. Uh, thank you for all your expressions of love over the last several days. Um, it just keeps coming and coming, and, and thank you so much. Uh, we just love you, and we appreciate you, and we're so thankful to God for you. Uh, had a great birthday present on Friday morning. Uh, we had a wonderful article that came out in the Greenwich Sentinel about our new church building. And, uh, and, and I like this. I'm going to take this. I'm, I'm just, you know, the Lord can even speak through a newspaper headline, right? The new Harvest Time Church. I like it. How many of you know the Bible says that the glory of the latter house will be greater than that of the former house? So I, I'm going to preach on that, the new Harvest Time Church. A winged wonder rises on King Street. The, um, the reporter who came out and sat with me a little bit to talk about the new building said, Pastor, she said, I just want you to know that the whole town is buzzing about this new building. She said, it's just such an unusual piece of architecture. It's such a striking piece of architecture. She said, everybody is just talking about it. And you know what? I'm so glad that people are buzzing about the new building because that gives us an opportunity to get them buzzing about Jesus. And that's what it's all about. So I was, I was so grateful to the Lord um, for that wonderful article about our church and about our new building. Well, uh, when we were talking about our 50th birthday and our 20th ministry anniversary, uh, I said to Pastor Faith and Pastor Nick, uh, I said, there's, there's one thing that I want, and that's for my dear friend, Bishop Chanker Singh from San Fernando, Trinidad, to come and to share the word of the Lord with us uh, on that weekend. Uh, we have in our presence this morning, we're blessed to have a real father and mother in the Lord. You know, St. Paul said that you might have 10,000 teachers in Christ, but you have very few fathers. And we have a real father and mother in the faith. Um, they have been friends to us across the years. They have been incredible role models to us. They have poured into us their prayers, their wise counsel, uh, the ministry of the word. The writer of Hebrews says, remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life. I want to tell you that miracles and blessings travel in their wake to their family, to their congregation. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Bishop's been here. Bishop and Sister Marilyn have been here on uh, several occasions. Uh, Sister Marilyn has a chance to had a chance to. Uh, we've done some missions traveling together with teams. Um, two years ago, Bishop uh, preached our missions convention, and after he went back to Trinidad, he contacted me, and he said, "Pastor Glenn, we would like your permission to be your partners in missions." And they started sending us missions giving from their congregation for us to distribute to the people that we work with all over the world. And especially while we've been putting up this new building and our, our funds have been going that way, uh, we've been bearing the expense of it, their partnership in missions has enabled us to do things that far, far beyond what we could have done on our own. Yeah, that's great. We have sown seed together in Poland. We have sown seed together in Ukraine. We have sown seed together in Africa, in India, in Nepal, in Myanmar. These are countries that are closed to the gospel. These are countries where there's great persecution from Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus, and communist governments. Right now, our friend Pastor Raymond Mui is in Thailand on the border of Laos doing uh, pastor's meetings and doing gospel crusades. And Laos is a closed country. Our president just came back days ago from Laos. It's a closed country, but the people are allowed to cross the border into Thailand. So the pastors who are struggling under tremendous persecution are there and they're getting poured into. And that's happening because of the partnership between Faith Center in Trinidad and Harvest Time Church. So I want to ask you, I know you just got settled, but please, would you stand on your feet and would you 
give your best welcome for our friends, Bishop Carlisle and Sister Marilyn Chanker Singh. Thank you very much. You may be seated. <clears throat> Thank you, Pastor Glenn, for giving us the honor of sharing with you this very, very special weekend, your 50th birthday and the 20th anniversary of you and your dear wife serving in the church. This is an honor for us, and we appreciate the opportunity. And church, I want to thank you, if you would allow me. My wife and I are the product of missions. We got saved as teenagers under missionaries that came from America. And I think it is safe to conclude that if you did not send missionaries, we would not be here. We probably would not be saved. We probably would not even be alive. I came from a broken home. My dad was an alcoholic. And when I was a child, I told God, I prayed two prayers. I said to God, number one, God, if you're listening to me, I want you to know I think you're very unfair. And uh, secondly, God, if you I, I think you're very unfair to have made me. And uh, secondly, if you had to make me, why did you have to put me in a family like this? There were many, many, many tears and very little laughter because of my dad's addiction. So we are very, very, very grateful for the gospel. It is the single best thing that's ever happened to us. And I want to bless you. And maybe not you directly, because all of you have come too late to be a blessing to me. But um, I, what I mean is that your grandparents and your great-grandparents and perhaps your parents, one way or another, your prayers and your giving are what God has used to touch our lives. And we are very, very, very thankful. And when we have an opportunity like this to come back and reciprocate, we grab it with both hands. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, as I see your pastors maintaining that emphasis on missions, again, I want to commend him and the leadership team here. Thank you. You are still reaching out. You're still sending missionary teams. You're still giving. You're still praying. When I came here two years ago, even though I was the product of missions, I had never heard of a single church that was doing as much as you were doing as missions. And we went back home, fired and charged up, and you heard Pastor Glenn say, thank you for giving us the opportunity now to partner with you. And every month, our office sends money to your missions money, to your missions account, so that now we are able to team up with you and doing for others what you have graciously done for us. We thank you, and I pray that God would bless you, whether you are the children or the grandchildren or the great-grandchildren, uh, you are the second generation, the third or the fourth generation. I pray God bless you for the sacrifices that previous... <laughs> Amen. And I mean that very sincerely. I pray God bless you for the investment previous generations made. You sent people to us who didn't know us, didn't know anything about us. They pulled up their roots, they left their home, their culture, their comfort to live under conditions that were far, far different. And the older I get, the greater appreciation I have for the missionaries that came to us 50 and 60 years ago. And I pray that the investment that generation made would bring blessings upon you in this generation because God is a generational God. Amen. Amen. And he will bless you and prosper you. So thank you. Thank you most sincerely. Thank you. And thank you for the teams that have come to Trinidad. I am looking forward to Pastor Glenn and the rest of you coming back and being with us every time you come. You are such a blessing. This man is such a man of love and humility. It's amazing. I've met quite a few people, and I watch him, and there is so much I could learn from him. Even though my wife told the previous service that we've got two children, our daughter has just turned 50, and our son will be 50 next month, and the pastor next year, the 9th of February, see, I remember, 
Our daughter was 50 on the 4th of March this year. Our son will be 50 on the 9th of February next year. And Pastor Glenn falls right in the middle. So my wife says that God has given us three children in one year. And that is fine with me. We feel honored to be a considered a part of this family. We love them. We love you very, very dearly. And thank you again. Thank you for your investment. And God bless you real well. I have been preaching all my life. I started preaching as a teenager. I don't know how much I've improved, but I've been preaching all my life. And uh, I have many, many, many sermons I've preached. And in waiting before the Lord for you, I felt like I must have the mind of the Lord in talking to you. And uh, the word I bring to you is, is seven letters. And uh, if, I had to, if, I, if I were told that I had one message to preach, that would be it. You know, if, if this is the last message I ever preached, that would be it. I feel so strongly about this message. I feel so passionately about it. And it's seven letters. It is easy to remember. It simply says, I beg you to listen to God. I beg you to listen to God. My wife and I are so grateful that we listen to him, not only to receive him into our hearts, which is a great, 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 great blessing. I don't think anybody has been able to really fully understand the prayer of the Apostle Paul when he said that Christ may dwell in your hearts, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints and to know the love of God, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I don't think there has been any theologian who ever lived who could fully expound that what it means to have Christ in your heart, to comprehend the love of God, to know the love of God, and the word know in the Bible means to experience, to comprehend, to know, and to be filled with all the fullness of God. How is that possible? How can a human being be filled with all the fullness of God? That's like trying to pour the ocean into a teacup. It defies human understanding. It takes the Holy Spirit to reveal that truth to you. No wonder long after he was caught up to the third heaven, long after he said, I saw visions that are not lawful for me to tell, long after he would still write in Philippians that I might know him. The man who shared the most intimate relationship with the Lord was still writing to the church at Philippi and saying that I might know him. So when you receive Christ into your heart, I am convinced there is no way we can really fathom the depth of that truth. Receiving Christ into your heart, but then going beyond that and making him the Lord of your life. And giving your life to him. So when I say my wife and I are thankful that we received him into our hearts as teenagers. We look back now over the last 60 years, almost 60 years. And we are so grateful that we listened to God. And we have done with our lives what he wanted us to do. And that's what I want to leave with you. Not just give him your heart, not just make him your savior, but to do with your life what he wants you to do. And think, my friend, when you come to the end of the age and you look back, I promise you there will be no regrets. If the Lord has called you to be a missionary, what a thrill. The Lord has called you into ministry the Lord has revealed to you the gift that you have and the calling that's on your life. There is nothing better you could do with your life than listen to God. There are other voices, the Bible says, voices that will pull you in contrary directions. Everybody will try to vie for your allegiance. But I beg you this morning to listen to God. And here is why. Here is why. He has your best interest at heart. 
And the devil will try to challenge that. Because the very first words spoken by the devil in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, are, has God said? Has God said? His very first utterance was to challenge what God said to Adam and Eve. Has God said? And he would say the same thing to you. Is God really speaking to you? Is that really from God? Did you really hear from God? He will still try to, because he knows. He doesn't know everything. But he knows enough to know that God has a bright future for you. And you know why he doesn't want you to have your place? Because he lost his permanently. He lost his permanently. And he doesn't want you to find your place in him. But I encourage you this, this morning, morning still, afternoon. I encourage you. I encourage you to listen to his voice because he has your best interest at heart. He is God. He's omniscient. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows everything, every detail of your life, everything you will face tomorrow and a year from now, and as long as you live. He knows every challenge, every trial, every difficulty, every heartache, every disappointment. He knows long before it happens. And he has your best interest at heart. And he will walk with you. And he will hold your hand. And he will order your steps. And he will guide you. That's why you should listen to him. You should listen to him because he loves you unconditionally unconditionally he loves you not because of who you are he loves you because of who he is he is love he loves you and will never stop loving you and nothing will ever separate you from his love you should listen to God because he has your best interest at heart you should listen to God because he loves you you should listen to God because he understands you there is hardly anybody who thoroughly understands you. You probably, there are times you don't understand yourself. The Apostle Paul said, wretched man that I am. The thing I tell myself I'm going to do, I struggle to do it. And the thing I tell myself will never happen to me, I fall into it. Oh, wretched man. I, but God understands you. And he loves you. And he has your best interest at heart. So I beg you. Listen to him. Does God speak to us? Of course he does. He speaks to us every day. The book of Hebrews says, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners, spake in times past through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken to us through his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things. Jesus is God's last word to man. The Bible you hold in your lap is God speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit will take that word and make it real and relevant to you. And he will speak to you about everything in your life. He'll speak to you about your finances. He'll speak to you about your health. He'll speak to you about handling your marriage. He speaks to you about your family. He speaks to you about your vocation. There is no area of your life that he's not concerned about. And he will speak to you. And that is why I beg you to listen to him. And his call to your life is always dual. The first call is a call to salvation. The second call is a call to service. Everybody has those two calls. He calls you to be saved. And then he calls you to serve him. And as you listen to that voice and let the faithful Holy Spirit lead you and direct you and order your steps, I promise you, my friend, you will never find a more fulfilling life, a more satisfying life, a more rewarding life than listening to God. There are several benefits in the Bible that accrue as a result of listening to God. Many of them, many of them. The one I want to leave with you this morning is the, 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 the reward of having your prayers answered. One of the rewards for listening to God and obeying him and following his rule for your life, one of the rewards is 
having your prayers answered. I know all of us here are praying people. We ought to be. We may be at different, various levels of prayer, but I want to encourage you to be like a Daniel. A long time ago, I made that decision. I was reading the book of Daniel, and I said, if Daniel, who served under five kings, who held the highest post in the country, who was the busiest and who was the most responsible man you could find, Daniel purposed in his heart that three times a day he would open his window and he would look towards these and he would pray. So he became known as a man of prayer. When God revealed that to me many, many years ago, I made a personal resolve that I would be a man of prayer and that it didn't matter what else happened every day of my life. I made sure every day of my life I would give God a certain amount of time in prayer. I want to encourage you to think about that. The Bible says the Lord Jesus, the night before he chose his 12 apostles, he spent all night in prayer. The Bible says he would get up a great while before day and depart into a solitary place and there he prayed. He said men ought always to pray and never to quit. The apostle Paul said we ought to pray without ceasing. And if Jesus, who is God in the flesh, needed to pray, what about you? What about me? I encourage you to make prayer a priority. But we don't only want to pray. We want to have the joy of having our prayers answered. And that's the secret I want to share with you this morning. One of the rewards for listening to God is that he will answer your prayers. And I want to take as my example the great man Elijah. And if you have your Bibles and you turn there to 1 Kings chapter 17... I simply want to point, draw something to your attention. First Kings chapter 17, verse 2, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, that's Elijah. The word of the Lord, say it after me, please. The word of the Lord came, the word of the Lord came. unto him, saying. Unto that is significant, because that is the theme of my message. When the word of the Lord comes to you, if you lay a hold of it, it will bring you into the glorious future God has for you. And one of the thrills you will experience is having your prayers answered. The verse we just read in verse 2, the Bible says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Now look how Elijah obeyed in verse 5. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. This is Elijah. The word came to him. He went and he did according to the word. I'm going to show you how because Elijah developed a reputation of doing what God said to him. When the time came, God did for Elijah what Elijah wanted. That's what I want to leave with you. Put another way. When we listen to God, God listens to us. When we listen to, I'll prove it to you in a minute. I'll prove it to you. When we listen to God, God listens to us. So one of the advantages, one of the rewards, one of the blessings of listening to God is that when you pray, you'll get answers. God will do for you what you say when you do for God what he says. I give you one example. Look at the next example. Look at verse 8 for the second time. And the word of the Lord came unto him saying, Arise, uh, Elijah, go down to Zarephath. And the Bible says he did just that in verse 10. So he arose and went. A man whose spirit was tuned to God, a man who was listening to God, and he had a keen ear. God only said it once. Elijah picked it up and he flowed. God only said it once. Elijah picked it up and he flowed. Now look at the marvelous result. 
Look at the marvelous result of this. Verse 22. And we read that verse. If you have your Bible, we read it together. And the Lord, what? Heard the voice of Elijah. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. I want you to connect the dots. I want you to connect the dots. The first part of the chapter says, God spoke to Elijah, Elijah moved. God spoke to Elijah, Elijah obeyed. I wonder, what is God speaking to you about in your life at this point in time? Because, you know, our destiny is determined by decisions. And every one of you here, every one of us is making decisions. Every one of us. And I wonder what the Lord is speaking to you now about whatever issue in your life. Maybe your finances. Maybe your marriage. Maybe your business. Maybe your ministry. Maybe somebody you need to forgive. Maybe a grudge you're carrying. Maybe something you're carrying in your spirit that is poisoning you. Maybe he's talking to you about a decision you've made that does not have his approval. Maybe about a decision you're contemplating and you really need his wisdom and he's dropping it in your spirit. What is God saying to you? That is my message to you this morning. I beg you to listen to God. And I've already told you why. Because he has your best interests. Because he loves you unconditionally. Because he understands you thoroughly. Because he knows your end from your beginning. I beg you to listen to God. Elijah is such an example. He listened to God. And no wonder, no wonder these tremendous answers to prayer. The one we read about is this widow woman whose son died. Nobody had ever been raised from the dead before. Elijah was going to ask God to do something that he had never done before. The raising of this woman's son is the first record in the Bible of a dead person coming back to life. Elijah had nothing in the past to inspire him. He had nothing in the past to provoke this degree of faith in him. Elijah became this man of faith and this man of answers to prayer because he was a man known for listening to God. And that's my message to you this morning, this afternoon. You listen to God. You obey his promptings. You do with your life what he wants you to do. Become a man of prayer. And not only a man of prayer and a woman of prayer, but become a person who gets prayers answered. Let me show you how important prayer is. And everything I'm telling you, I know you know. Because your pastor is a scholar. And he studies and he preaches and he teaches. And I am sure that you are a congregation well fed. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 4. God said he will give us prophets. He will give us pastors who feed us knowledge and understanding. And I'm sure that you are such a people. But let me tell you something about prayer. The Bible says that we should be careful for nothing. And the word careful there means don't fret. Don't worry. Don't age prematurely. Don't let any worry, any grief, any tragedy take you to your grave prematurely. Be careful for nothing. Let me tell you why that is important this morning. The World Health Organization, not a religious body, the World Health Organization has said the number one killer by 2020 will be not cancer, not diabetes, not heart trouble. The number one killer by the year 2020 will be depression. Depression. The World Health Organization says by the year 2020, the number one killer in the world will be depression. The word of God answers that. It brings into play Philippians 4, 6, where God says to you and to me, be careful for nothing, be worried for nothing, be stressed out for nothing, but in everything by prayer, say prayer, yeah. by prayer and supplication, say supplication, yeah. with thanksgiving, say with thanksgiving, yeah. 
Let me tell you a secret. While you're praying, every once in a while, take a break to give thanks. In the prayer meeting, yeah, go ahead. In the prayer meeting, take a break. Take breaks all along, intermittently, to give thanks. To give thanks. In your private prayer life, stop to give thanks. Always we can find things to be thankful for. Say amen. God bless you this morning. You were able to dress yourself. You were able to feed yourself. You were able to come to church. Listen, there are always things to grumble about, but there are many, many more things to be thankful for. Say amen. And so the Bible says, so the Bible says, be careful for nothing. Stop worrying. Stop being stressed out. Stop being anxious. Here is the answer. Be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That's prayer. The next verse tells us the reward. The next verse tells you, and the peace of God. Say the peace of God. The peace of God, Jesus said, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Say the peace of God. The peace of God. God that passes all understanding. People cannot understand why you're not losing your mind. People cannot understand why you can still dance and praise and give God glory. It's not because you have no challenges. You may have more challenges than them, but along with the challenges, you are experiencing something called the peace of God. Let me tell you something about peace. It comes in measures. For example, Psalm 119, 195 says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. You love God's word. You love God speaking to you. You count it a privilege to hear God's voice. What an Honor for the Almighty God to condescend to speak to a human creature. What an honor. What an honor. Do you realize this afternoon how blessed we are for God to be speaking to us? Words of guidance, words of comfort, words of counsel, words of encouragement. Do you know what an honor that is? No wonder the Bible says, they who love God's voice have great peace. You know what is God's answer for dementia and Parkinson's and mental illness and schizophrenia and the things that science is telling us will be our number one health enemy by 2020? You want to know what is God's answer? Something called his peace. His peace. Be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with what? Beautiful. I know you know God's word. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And what is the reward? And the peace of God. Hallelujah. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Notice what it will do. It will keep your heart. God is still the best cardiologist. And keep your mind. He's still the best psychiatrist. I tell you, he knows every challenge you will face before you face it. Every heartache, every disappointment, every letdown, every pain that you will face, he knows about it long before you face it. And this is why I beg you to listen to him. Because listening to him gives you a degree of security that you'll not find anywhere else. A place of safety. Say me amen. 
a place of comfort, a place of security. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Because of your prayers. Because of your prayers. Notice that. Let your request be made known unto God. Handle it God's way. And the peace of God will come. And that's the life Elijah lived. And you remember when Elijah himself became depressed? You remember this mighty, perhaps there is nobody more flamboyant in all the Old Testament than Elijah. The greatest man ever born was John the Baptist, and he is claimed, he is said to have had the spirit of Elijah. And as powerful as Elijah was, he knew what it was to hear the threats of Jezebel and to run off under a Jupiter tree and to wish he could die. And the word of the Lord came to him. And it didn't come in the fire. And it didn't come in the earthquake. And it didn't come in the storm. But thank God it came. It came in a still small voice. And may God speak to you today. And comfort you. And encourage you. And strengthen you. And build your faith. And reassure you of his unconditional love. And his care for you. And the best thing you could do is to heed my message this morning and listen to him. Don't resist him. Listen to him. The time came when Elijah, and I close with that now, Elijah there in 1 Kings chapter 17, he's going to raise this dead, boy's, uh, this dead boy back to life. And of course, the mother is distraught. Only son, and he's dead. And the Bible says that in chapter in chapter 17 that the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. How many of you would like for God to hear your voice? But you know what? God heard Elijah's voice because Elijah was in the habit of hearing God's voice. God heard Elijah's voice because Elijah was in the habit of hearing God's voice. That's why I beg you to listen to God. Because one of the rewards is when you cry, God will hear your voice. You see, there has been an intimacy developed between you and God. A stranger that will not follow. My sheep know my voice. And they follow me. And that's what he wants with you. Did you know that? Did you know more than anything else in this world God wants with you? It's an intimate relationship. We used to sing. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me. You all are too young to remember that. We learned that one in the ark. <laughs> and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. What a life. What a life. It's interesting, Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my what? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my what? See, I know you know the word. Any man. Are you that man this morning? Are you that woman this morning? It's one thing for him to speak to a body of people, but then he zeroes in and he talks to you as an individual. Do you agree? I said, do you agree? Now he's talking to you as an individual. And he's telling you, I know you. I know you better than you think I know you. I know better than you know yourself. And I love you. And I care for you. And I have a great plan for you. I have a future for you that's indescribable. I has not seen and heirs that no heard. And man cannot imagine the things I have prepared for you. 
and all I beg of you is that you listen to me. Hear my voice and follow me. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I'll sup with him and he with me. We fellowship together. We love a bond. We love a relationship. And the Lord Jesus put it this way. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. Can I ask you to stand with me as we go to prayer?